Welcome, Ismay. <laughs> Welcome to Case Western Reserve University. Welcome to the 2018 uh, International Society for Military Ethics Annual Conference. And I'm glad some of you got to uh, come to our uh, little reception last night in the Inamori Center. If you weren't able to, please make a point at some point today to uh, walk on down and see our Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence down the hall. And you are currently in the Tinkhamville University Center building here at Case Western. And I hope you will, like me, appreciate the symbolism that our university has done by putting the Ethics Center literally at the heart of campus. It means a lot to, to us and the work that we do uh, to have that kind of not only symbolic but actual support. And so it seemed a fitting place to bring uh, this society for its annual meeting. CASE has a strong commitment to military ethics and we are, in addition to hosting this, this uh, fine organization, we are also uh, launching the first in the country master's degree program in military ethics. And in a little bit, I'll show you a very short uh, video about that, and we can tell you more about it if you're interested, um, which involves uh, scholars like yourselves and hopefully the next generation of scholars in military ethics that we are trying to cultivate. For those of you who are of a social media bent, I would appreciate it if when you are talking about these events here today, uh, we now have a, uh, an Ismay uh, Twitter, uh, thanks to our wonderful colleague, Tim, thank you. You wanna wave your hand? <laughs> He's done this. Um, and uh, we're using the hashtag at ISMIL, so ISMILETHICS2018. And that will also help you find the Twitter account, which is also IS Mill Ethics. So, you know, we gotta get ourselves out there and be, be part of this. We also have an account for the Inamori Center and I have a personal account, which is SE French. So please make use of that if that's something that you do. I also hope that while you're here, you will take advantage of being at the heart of University Circle more broadly. As some of you have seen and you have information in your little bags about this, um, this area has a wonderful range of things that you can enjoy while you're here, including many museums. And our Cleveland Museum of Arts um, uh, actually has recently been honored as having had um, the second best uh, collection to, believe it or not, the Met in New York. So we in Little Cleveland are very proud of that. And it's free and open to the public. So make sure you make time to make it there or the Botanical Gardens or the other museums in the circle, possibly even hear the Cleveland Orchestra at Severance. But most of all, I hope that you will enjoy the kind of productive conversations that we're going to hopefully have all day today and part of the day tomorrow. And we are looking for engagement. I want everyone to uh, come ready to talk. Um, no one is going to be um, just reading a paper at you. Everything is a conversation. We've even got our wonderful keynote speaker has agreed to do Q&A, which is not always the case with a keynote. But we want everything to be interactive for you. So we hope you will take advantage of that. And uh, um, if you have any logistical issues, uh, you can always ask me, and then my outstanding associate director, Dr. Laura McHale. Laura, she's in the corner there, wave, uh, who has set up most of what you have seen and enjoyed already. Um, Laura can help with everything. And then uh, folks like Jacob in the back, uh, who are our student staff and um, wise beyond their years, <laughs> they can help you with things too. So hopefully with all of us and the whole ISME board uh, here to help you, uh, we will not have any logistical challenges. We just want you all to have a great time with us here in Cleveland and uh, enjoy this opportunity to, to see what we can learn together. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our ISME esteemed president, Dr. George Lucas, and he will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, George. Wow. Uh, thank you, Shannon, and thank you, everybody, for being here. You have no idea. We've been through a rough weekend uh, uh, with uh, the federal government, uh, U.S. federal government shutdown and uh, worries that many of you wouldn't be able to come, and so glad that 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 
we see so many old friends, uh, distinguished guests, and, uh, and new participants in the International Society for Military Ethics. Uh, this is an historic occasion uh, in many respects, as Professor French indicated, with the, we're helping them by meeting here to inaugurate the, um, the new military ethics program. I'm privileged to teach in that program as an adjunct professor this year, and uh, Dr. David Wetham uh, from the uh, King's College in London uh, and the UK Defense Academy in Shrivenham will be next year's guest professor in the program. We're trying, they're trying their best to make sure that this organization and our international membership are part of studying what military ethics is and how it can be fostered and supported. Um, in that uh, vein, I'd like to at least give a shout out to a, a few special guests that I hope you'll track down and look up and have a conversation with from our sister chapters. Uh, in the um, European Union, the Euro-ISME group, as we call them, the European International Society for Military Ethics chapter. Uh, Dr. Ted Van Barta is here. He's our executive uh, director of, uh, of, of ISME, and I mentioned already the name David Wetham. Professor Wetham is here. I saw him a minute ago uh, in back, uh, uh, who's, who is really one of the founding uh, forces behind uh, Euro-ISME. Um, and is serving on their board. Um, we have the one of the two current editors of the Journal of Military Ethics here, Dr. Martin Cook. Martin, where are you? Uh, there he is. Actually, as of this term, uh, Jim Cook is the is replacement. And now Jim Cook is the editor. Good, good. Well, Martin, welcome back <laughs> from where he's been teaching in Ghana. Uh, after his retirement from the Air Force Academy, and then I was going to turn to Jim Cook in any case because he is here as part of the delegation from uh, the U.S. Air Force Academy that just barely made it, <laughs> and we're so glad to have them, as well as Colonel David Barnes and Richard Schoonhoven and other colleagues from West Point who are here, um, Ed Barrett, uh, and... Uh, I'm sure Ed is here someplace from the Stockdale Center, and uh, he was, but, but if not, he'll, he'll be here later. I'm not sure B.J. Strouser is here yet from NPS, uh, but he will be later. So we have a nice representation from our U.S. and also then our Canadian Defense Force Academies, where our own uh, program chairman, who's put together this wonderful session in uh, collaboration with Shannon, Dr. Stephanie Belanger, in the back of the room from uh, the Royal Military College in Kingston, and a number I can see of our members of the Canadian Defense Force as well as our uh, U.S. Uniformed Services here, uh, folks from Europe and also Australia. Uh, both uh, Dr. Stephen and Dr. Nikki Coleman from the Australian Defense Academy are here, and a delegation of officers and, and colleagues uh, from down under. So we have a really terrific, uh, perhaps one of the best we've ever had, and it's also encouraging to see the growth of interest. Uh, the Australians helped put together the most recent chapter, the APAC, ISME, as we call it, the Pacific Rim Group. Uh, which really is the newest and in many ways the most strategically placed um, conversation about military ethics that we can, that we can handle. Um, so it's an exciting and historic time, as I say. And in the discouragement of the past week, my, my wife, who was going to join me and also teaches military ethics, she's a professor of philosophy and a former government official, um, said, don't, don't get discouraged. Tell Shannon not to get discouraged. Tell our colleagues not to, you know, you have to hang in there and think that this is, in the end, all about the students, about the young people, the young officers, uh, the young civilian students, the future. Uh, we can't get mired in the politics of the present. We have to not get discouraged and try to keep these ideals alive for the students that we're privileged to serve and to teach one of whom, a former one of whom, is now back as our keynote speaker today, and it's my privilege to introduce him, Midshipman Reuben E. Brigady II, who graduated from the Naval Academy in the class of 1995, where he was brigade commander 
And all of our military folks know that that's a rank that consists of the highest honor the Brigade of Midshipmen or the Cadet Corps or Wing can bestow upon one of their peers uh, alongside the con uh, concurrence of their um, commanding officers. Um, it recognizes the potential as well as the current exercise of true ethical leadership. And in this case, uh, the Naval Academy and the Brigade of Midshipmen of the Class of 1995 could not have been more correct in their assessment. I came to the Naval Academy as a teacher a year after Dr. Brigady had, had graduated, so I didn't get to know him as a student. Um, but I've been privileged ever since, kind of like a fly on the wall or uh, a spectator in the stands, to watch the incredible, uh, I wouldn't call it meteoric, I would call it sustained and impressive uh, development of his career over the last uh, two decades since his graduation and brings us the privilege of having him with us today. He went on to serve his term of uh, required tour of duty in the United States Navy in several interesting capacities and ended up going on from there to earn his doctoral degree, master's and doctoral degree at Cambridge University in England. When I first actually laid eyes on Ambassador Brigady, uh, he was a young assistant professor, uh, at least from my perspective, young, assistant professor at George Mason University, professor of public policy. And he went on from, he had served as also as a uh, staff person, uh, uh, ambassador representative with the distinguished international group uh, Human Rights Watch. Uh, he brought that passion for human rights and the ethical treatment of vulnerable peoples everywhere to the passion of his job in public policy, both teaching and going on into the foreign service, serving as an ambassador, uh, representative, uh, for the U.S. to the African Union, the permanent representative of the U.S. to the U.N. Economic Commission for Africa. He served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of African Affairs and um, also in the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migrations. So you see where that concern uh, all the time that first manifested itself in his work in Human Rights Watch continued during his career with the State Department and he brings all that now to an amazing and distinguished position. He is Dean of the Elliott School of Public Policy, probably the, most, the, the largest and most distinguished school of public policy in the country at George Washington University in Washington, DC. He's also a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. I shouldn't bore you with my view on the Council on Foreign Relations, a group that I think could be a, a bunch of elitist snobs who are usually 180 degrees wrong in every policy prediction they make, except they finally got it right and appointed Ambassador Brigady to one of them, and I have great hope for the future of the Council. Um, a member of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, an adjunct senior fellow for African peace and security issues. He's on the board of trustees of the Carter Center and also on the Atlantic Council. And if you know what those bona fides mean, both on the Council of Foreign Relations, my cynical remarks notwithstanding, and on the Atlantic Council, that means that he is a mover, a shaker, a person in a position of great authority and bestowed with great prestige and it is a great honor to have him as our keynote speaker this morning, Ambassador Brigady. Um, if you get close enough, you can see how much I'm blushing with that uh, amazing introduction. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, Shannon, George, uh, Marty, uh, other friends, uh, colleagues, it's my great honor to be with you here uh, in the balmy climate of Cleveland um, to uh, help start off uh, this uh, amazing conference. Let me also, again, congratulate um, let me, uh, let me also congratulate uh, you, Shannon, and the Inamori Center for all the work you've done here for over the years and for this amazing new facility uh, that you have, which I understand will now be the home of ISME um, going forward. I would just respectfully suggest you might want to hold a conference in April as opposed to <laughs> January in years going forward, but, but who am I to say? Uh, so what I'd like to do um, with my remarks, uh, which I hope we can follow with a... Um, uh, robust conversation to, uh, to get us going, 
is uh, think through the question of strategic dissent for the military officer and also by extension by others that may, civilians that may also be involved in the defense and national security enterprise. It has been some time since I've been an active scholar of uh, international uh, military ethics. Um, however, uh, in the time that I've been away from scholarship, I've been busy uh, and have uh, lived uh, these issues both as a practitioner in the field, um, in uh, working on uh, not only a series of, of, of refugee and policy-related issues in Africa, but also a series of uh, working closely with my military colleagues on a series of direct action uh, military matters uh, as well. And I bring that sensibility uh, as well to the work that we do at the Elliott School, which I'll talk about at the end of my talk. So I, I say all that to say that while I have been away from the subject as a, an active scholar, I continue to be interested, at times even obsessed, with the question of dissent. Uh, its role in not only the shaping and conduct of policy, uh, but also its role in a very personal matter, a very personal way for the individual uh, that is often charged with executing or standing by or watching uh, some of the most weighty events, not only of national security, but frankly of import uh, for, for individual human lives. One of the reasons that I find the question of dissent of particular importance in the military context is that, of course, and first look, it seems to be antithetical to the entire military enterprise. At least a layman might suggest that, that that might be the case. Why might that be the case? Because, again, from not only from the outside, but also from a series of strictures uh, how military life is governed, obedience and discipline are at the core of the military profession. And not simply arbitrarily, but because, of course, discipline which implies obedience to orders, certainly obedience to legal orders, is necessary in order to break through or control the so-called fog of war and uh, the, the, the sorts of chaos that happens on the battlefield. That, therefore, is necessary in order to achieve victory on the battlefield or at sea. That is also necessary in order, as Clausewitz uh, uh, aficionados would, uh, would recognize, to achieve the political objectives for which one uses force in the first place. So if one follows that train of logic, one can assume by the transitive property of ethics uh, that obedience is tied to achieving the political ends for the use of force. What happens, however, if that theory is wrong? Or if, on certain occasions, one can actually help achieve the political objectives for which one is actually engaging in the use of force, act not, by obe not by obeying, but by dissenting? There are any number of models, any number of circumstances, any number of real-world examples by which one can suggest this actually might be the theory that we ought to be thinking about, at least in certain circumstances. Whether it be the very well-known, well-publicized uh, examples of Milai on the one hand and Abu Ghraib on the other, or whether it be any number of drone strikes that may have led to civil civilian casualties in environments where one had hoped they were trying to actually cultivate the population uh, to support our political objectives, even as one prosecutes conflict against known or suspected terrorist subjects. Or leave aside the question of these high stakes, high profile uh, uses of force. What if what we're talking about in certain circumstances is the ability to dissent against an, an officer 
or a superior that one knows is taking illegal or unethical action. Whether it be accepting a dinner party or access to prostitutes or um, Lady Gaga tickets. Um, when, uh, when, one, when a junior officer thinks that might not be the case? Or what if what we're talking about is not on that level of professional uh, personal conduct, but rather broader questions of policy? What role is there for the officer who thinks, you know, I'm not sure that the, that the intelligence actually suggests that there's weapons of mass destruction in this particular location. What is one supposed to do? Of course, this is important not only from these sorts of real world examples, but also, frankly, from questions of ethical theory, because as you know, those of you who obviously are far more uh, uh, esteemed in the area of professional ethics know, one of the most important questions of ethics is not only, not only what, how do we know what is ethical, but also the question of agency. So in, in essence, it is almost irrelevant, certainly merely academic, if one is simply talking about what the right ethical decision is, if the individual actor does not have the, about the, the, the quality of agency to be able to make an informed decision, indeed be able to act on whatever the ethical analysis may be. And herein lies the fundamental rub for the military officer. On the one hand, she is trained to obey orders. She is also trained to assume that the chain of command by which she receives these orders is acting legally, acting ethically, and also acting in support of the national interest. And if that is the default position of the institution, then the question happens, what, there are several questions that result from that. The first is, how do you know that that series of assumptions is actually operative? Which is to say that the orders that one receives are legal, are ethical, and are in the national interest. Second, let's assume, one, one, let's, let's assume that one can, uh, can accept the legal analysis. What is the ethical framework by which one is even to interpret even what might ostensibly otherwise be legal orders? Is it one's own personal religious conviction? Is it what one understands to be the broader ethical frame of, um, of, of one's country? Is it something else? And how does one have access and how does one uh, be able to adjudicate those sorts of ethical choices? The third really quite important question is that even if one can identify the right level of analysis. Are we talking about battlefield decision? Are we talking about high policy? Are we talking about questions of, of individual conduct? And even if one can affirmatively understand the normative structures that are available to help adjudicate those questions, whether it be matters of law or ethics, then you get to one series of systemic issues. So what systems are in place to be able to actively act on such dissent, or at least to be able to raise such questions. This is actually a crucially important point. And it's crucially important if for no other reason that there are actually multiple different models that are available, not only in the military, but amongst different militaries and indeed amongst different uh, professions. Let me give you a couple of examples. So as George mentioned, I've spent um, uh, six years in the State Department. One, the State Department, the US State Department was modeled, the Foreign Service State Department was modeled on the US military. So the, although they don't wear uniforms, there is obviously a question of hierarchy. There are ranks that are meant to be expected and is also based on the general proposition that particularly when you're trying to implement and execute policy halfway around the world, there has to be some level of discipline between what is decided in capitals and what is actually executed on the ground. In that sense, not unlike you know, sending a ship at sea. And yet, because one's uh, uh, thinking about these questions of policy that can often be complicated, there is, as you may know, a formal dissent channel within the State Department through which any diplomat 
can actually raise questions or concerns about the policy that he is actually meant to actually execute. Not only is there a formal channel for dissent, there is, at least there used to be prior to in the previous administration, um, there traditionally has been a formal reward for the best dissent report in the State Department on any given year. Why is that important? Because it shows to the institution what respectful dissent ought to look like and how it ought to be rewarded and what the expectations are of the institution for how dissent can actually be valuable to the mission of the institution as a whole. Let's take another example from medicine, which is a, another discipline uh, where particularly in the context of surgery or triage, there is hierarchy from physicians to nurses to uh, physicians assistants, et cetera, where there is an expectation that a doctor's request for a patient will be followed. In fact, those requests are called orders in the, mil in the medical environment. And also where there is the assumption that in the operating theater, the surgeon is the highest authority, not only as a matter of law, but because the surgeon has the most technical experience about uh, the procedure. As a result of a series of challenges with regard to medical mistakes in the United States over the last decade, what is now common practice, certainly in surgery, surgery rooms across the United States, is that everybody in the operating theater is now empowered, whether they are a surgeon or a nurse or a surgical tech, to stop or raise their hand at any given time to say, I see something that does not look right, even if they may not happen to be the most senior person in the room. So I raise this to say that and there, are, there are other examples from aviation, there are other examples from you know, oil drilling, particularly in light of uh, the Deepwater Horizon fiasco and others. There are other examples in which one is actually from other disciplines, from other professions, in which one actually recognizes not only that dissent is not inherently bad, but actually can be vital to achieving the appropriate mission of the institution. And they have enabled systems to be able to do that. The final question that I have, and the final area that I would, I would posit for discussion, is in addition to levels of analysis, in addition to questions of, 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 of the, the, the moral framework to make decisions, in addition to questions of system, are questions of training and incentives. This is the most difficult part, I would argue, certainly in the military context. How does one simultaneously train a person to charge the hill, to take out the machine gun nest, and to obey the lawful orders of those imposed, uh, appointed over them, and also train them to not only be comfortable with, but indeed the necessity of speaking up with dissent when they see that something is antithetical to the mission, values, law that govern the organization. I would submit to you that this is the greatest challenge that certainly in the context of multiple military environments that we face. It's a challenge for a variety of reasons. One, it, e even for the most wise experienced amongst us, living with those two fundamental tension in one's head, even in an academic environment, is incredibly challenging. It's even more challenging under the strains of, opera, of real world operations when you're really at sea or you're really engaged in combat and the people against whom you must dissent are also the people on, whose lie, on whom you must depend for your own life. That's really hard. And yet, don't we all wish that more people had more of a desire to speak up earlier during Abu Ghraib? Don't we all wish that more people had uh, uh, the opportunity to speak up and challenge Lieutenant uh, uh, Kali earlier so that Miley would never have been a stain on the record of the United States in the first place? And don't we all wish that more lieutenant commanders or commanders or junior lieutenants had said something when they saw this contractor in the Seventh Fleet doing all kinds of really shady things that is now fundamentally upset an entire generation of naval officers and put into question our entire, frankly, our entire position in all of East Asia from a, from a naval perspective. 
So I don't know what the answers to these four questions are on a, on a practical basis. As I say, I um, have to run a school so I don't have as much time to actually sort of uh, 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 to, to, to think about them myself. But I do know that these are the questions, at least these four, that must dominate our thinking in this area. Accordingly, one of the things, although I don't have time to, to write about it, one of the great things about being dean is that you actually have an opportunity to set up programs. So one of the things that we have done, two things we've done at the Elliott School, uh, which George said is uh, correctly, is the largest school of international affairs in the United States. We have almost 3,200 students. Is we have articulated a vision for what we're doing at the Elliott School uh, that, is, that we characterize as at the acronym STEP, S-T-E-P, which stands for Achieving Elite Excellence in Scholarship, Teaching, Ethics, and Practice. The reason we have ethics in our core mission is I tell all of our students that international affairs students are a special breed of student because by definition they care about the state of the world and they want to prepare themselves to go off and fight the world's fight. And if you do so, I tell our students, I can guarantee you, you will face very challenging ethical problems. And thus, it is vital for us while you're here in, you know, in our scholarly community that we give you the best preparation to know what doing the right thing feels like and that you, we also give you not only the background knowledge but help to sort of develop your courage to be able to do the right thing when your time of questioning comes. Accordingly, the second thing we've done is we've established something that we're calling the LEAP Academy, which stands for the Leadership Ethics and Practice Academy, which amongst other things uh, has as its responsibility teaching ethics across all of our curricula for our, our international affairs students at the undergraduate and graduate level, creating a series of uh, lecture series and other events to actually show our students what practical ethical decision making actually looks like and the fact that you can actually make ethical decisions and survive. <laughs> you can actually dissent without having to throw away your career. You can actually stand up and be counted and live to tell the story as opposed to the fears that if one stands up in a variety of different ways, that will be the very last thing that you can do. And we're doing so, as I say, because we think that not only is it important for us to do, but quite frankly, we also hope that other similarly placed institutions will also place the, uh, an important, similar importance on ethics in international affairs. Uh, because we don't see this as a competition, we actually sort of see this as part of a community. All of us are trying to do our very best to train the next generation of young people to go off and fight the world's fight. So let me conclude my opening remarks before we go into um, what I hope will be a, um, an interesting uh, uh, question and answer session debate amongst ourselves by reiterating something that George said, and that is that what all of you are doing as scholars uh, and also as practitioners in the space of uh, professional military ethics could not be more vital and could not be more timely. Uh, one only has to take a look not only at the series of headlines that are happening politically in all of our countries, uh, but also take a look at the really quite serious security challenges that we're facing in multiple parts of the world. And note that in addition to having the technical expertise to solve them, we also need people that are rooted in questions of fundamental human dignity, and also rooted in what it takes, as uh, Dr. Inamori says, uh, what does it take to be a decent human being and to bring that sensibility to their work. So thank you very much. I look forward to our questions. And more importantly, I wish you all the best for this wonderful conference here in Cleveland. Thank you. Yes. Dr. Cook, I'm sorry, before you say, I actually, so I now, I've learned something. I now know that in order to be the editor of the Journal of Professional Military Ethics, your last name needs to be Cook, uh, <laughs> and you need to be either currently or have been employed at the United States Air Force Academy. So I guess I'm, I'm doubly out. But please, continue. Nice to see you. Yes, sir. Uh, two, two quotes. Um, in, the, uh, in the U.S. military, starting with the work of Don Snyder in the Army about 20 years ago, a lot of the questions are interested in framed around the question of is military service a profession, or are we merely obedient bureaucrats? Right. And a lot of the training has gone on through the organization.
organizations in the Army um, to stress the importance of helping people think of themselves as professionals. Yes. But one of the implications of that is if you're truly a profession, then there's an internal ethic of things yes. that you will and you won't do. And yes. so yes. there are things you could ask your doctor to do for you that they would simply refuse on the grounds that's that correct. I can't do that in that's a way correct. that's consistent with my professional obligation. So, um, but they're clearly, the professions that you, in, that you listed are more firmly on the professional side and less on the bureaucratic side. Yes than military service. Uh, any thoughts about how that balance will help us either clarify or muddy the waters? Yep. Uh, and then the second point, uh, an area I've gotten really interested in the last few years is when military people talk about ethics, they talk usually in Aristotelian terms, in terms of character and integrity. And the mm -hmm. idea is that individuals have these characteristics, mm -hmm. and if they have them, then they're reliable, mm -hmm. and they would be good to go in kind of any environment. But the literature in, in moral psychology shows that, in fact, context affects people's behavior yes. uh, to almost incredibly counterintuitive ways. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at something like uh, uh, Fat Leonard Scandal in Seventh mm -hmm. Fleet, my prediction is what's going to turn out to be true there is we send a few bad people there, mm -hmm. but we also had a really bad environment in yes. Seventh Fleet yes. that, you know, that signaled to people that when you come out here, unless you really want to be the standout, you, would, you want to, as the newbie, you want to fit in. Right. And so right. all military organizations are like that. And mm -hmm. so whatever the espoused ethic of the organization is, mm -hmm. we all know individual units have different ethics based on those mm -hmm. environmental factors. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you experience mm -hmm. that, I'm sure, within the State Department yes. and different subcultures in state. So just those two points, any reflections? Sure. About I think those are both excellent questions. Um, so first, on the issue of whether or not the military is a profession or a collection of organized bureaucrats and what the applications of that are, I fall firmly, heartily on the side that it is a profession and must be a profession. Now, I don't think that the fact that it is a profession necessarily, uh, and I'll come back to why I think that in a moment, I don't think that the fact that it is a profession is necessarily in tension with the law or legal strictures because all the other professions that I've talked about, for example, medicine, right? Not only are there, or the law, the law as a profession. I mean, not only are there canons of professional ethics, but they're also governed by various, you know, state, in some cases, federal law, about what they can or can't do, which is part of the reason why you need a license to practice, part of the reason why you can be sued, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the fact that, for example, there is the, in the U.S. context and with its analogs elsewhere, the U.S. Code of Military Justice, which requires certain legal aspects, certainly as regards to obedience, obedience to orders necessarily, doesn't, all, doesn't necessarily mean that there cannot be as well an accompanying, perhaps sometimes even a superseding code of ethics that goes above and beyond what the law in any particular case requires. Let me give you what I think is sort of the nightmare example of this. Um, I'm going to try to state this as apolitically as I can, based on what I understand to be some of um, the discussion. In light of the rising tensions between the United States and North Korea on the Korean Peninsula, with many in the foreign policy community, particularly in that hard bastion of elitist sort of people that get it wrong, the Council on Foreign Relations, um, there is serious, has been serious concern that we have been at the closest possibility of a real world nuclear exchange since the Cuban Missile Crisis. As a result of this, there have been a number of rumors, none of which I have seen corroborated, but which I have seen reported multiple times in what I would consider to be credible news outlets of what, and also very real discussions as matters of law about who has the authority to actually launch American nuclear weapons. And does the President of the United States have sole authority to be able to do that? And as those particularly, I see at least one submariner in the, off, in, in the, uh, in the audience, um, we know that America's nuclear deterrent was built for maximum um, um, efficiency and response time and less to create multiple redundancies for reflection at the highest levels. There are redundancies at the tactical level, dual key, whatever, but certainly at the highest level, the national uh, command authority. So one can reasonably ask for senior military officers or senior civilians that are closest to the president and are part of the NCA, is there 
a professional military ethic of dissent or disobedience that could regionally be called for in an environment where it is unclear that the launch of a nuclear weapon, particularly given the politics around that, is in the best interest of the country. Now, that is not simply my assertion. As we know, this has actually been really quite actively sort of debated. But there are, there are any number of other sort of further examples, you know, further down the line. I, I would, you know, for example, refer you to, um, um, you know, one of our scholars at the, at the LA School is a scholar named uh, Hugh Gusterson. Maybe you may know his work. He wrote this book last year called Drone, which is, talks about sort of the ethics of, uh, of, um, of use of uh, remote um, uh, vehicles and whatnot. And I think that poses a whole other series of questions. So I, I fall firmly on, on the question that, that it must be a profession, that the nature of profession actually helps psychologically the individual, you know, military member. Uh, and that, frankly, we would actually do better not only to embrace it as a profession, but actually not only has medicine and, and law does, is done, but actually do an awful lot more to tease out what that means, particularly as it means, particularly as it relates to matters of dissent, and what the sort of the lines of ethical beyond beyond simply obeying lawful orders. What are the lines of appropriate conduct? Which then gets to the um, uh, the second question. I also firmly believe that. Um, in addition to whatever anyone's individual predilections may be, context matters greatly. I absolutely believe that. I act, and I also believe, frankly, that in most cases, uh, m most people are capable of most things given the right or wrong set of circumstances. Uh, and our institutions assume that, which is not only why we sort of focus so much on the rule of law, but also why we spend so much time uh, on training ethics, it's why we, you know, go to houses of worship regularly because it's not the assumption that, for example, I'm a Christian. You, I would never say, you know, I went to Sunday school once back in 1987. I'm good. I got it. Thank you very much. Right? I mean, you sort of continue to actually continue to exercise that ethical um, framework uh, a great deal on an individual level, but it's also why it's crucially important for individual leaders and also for institutions to create that enabling environment. If I may, share, I know we're live streaming, so I'm going to be very careful about how I say this next piece. So the Fat Leonard scandal has, as I mentioned, sucked up an entire generation, maybe even two generations of naval officers, two of which I've happened to know. Uh, they were both in my company when I, was at, when I was a midshipman in the Naval Academy. One happened to be a classmate of mine. The other happened to be a first class midshipman, a senior, um, one of whom I would have been the last person in the world I ever would have expected to be sucked into this environment, literally. And I, for, as a matter of record, I have no independent knowledge about what I'm about to say. <laughs> but what I suspect could have happened is that this person, because of what I know about him and also what I know about his past conduct, probably tried to do the right thing initially. And then, as a result of the total environment, as a result of what was happening as a, for amongst his superiors and seniors, eventually, as because we know what Fat Leonard's MO was, you know, it got brought in a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and a little bit closer, and then decides, well, am I really going to be the sucker who's going to try to be the Boy Scout when clearly everybody knows that this is how business is done out here? And one of the things I wonder is, how did the system fail somebody like that? In addition to what his own clear personal failings were, why do we have a, what was happening such that so many other people who otherwise had very distinguished careers that went to all the appropriate session sources, that had all the mandatory ethical training, that all took their kids to you know, synagogue or, or temple or whatever on Sundays or Fridays or whatever, how did so many people get this so wrong over such a long period of time? And I have to think that part of it is that we somehow failed systemically to create, create strictures where junior people at sea in very challenging environments, far away from the flagpole, were sufficiently empowered to be able to challenge what is clearly wrong behavior. And it, had we been able to shift that and created better strictures, it would have saved everybody an awful lot of heartache. I actually have a rule when I do um, um, uh, teaching, and that rule is I insist in gender parity in questions. Uh, so I go, uh, gentlemen, ladies, gentlemen, ladies. So I'm going to open the floor to ladies first, and then we'll go back to another gentleman. Thank you.
you'll probably still be next. Ladies, is there a question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Need you wait for the microphone. <laughs> My name is Lisa. I'm a military ethics uh, MA student here at Case Western. And uh, my question had to do with what you were talking about with training and having people able to be able to dissent. Yes. So one of the things that I was looking at in research was um, the lack of ethical training for enlisted members. Um, this is just kind of my opinion, but it looks like from what I've seen, there's a little bit of a bias against just regular enlisted members thinking maybe they can't handle it, it's too much for them. Um, in terms of scholarship. So how would you kind of recommend tying those two things together yeah. so that you have enlisted members who have an ethical framework to work with to be able to know when they can dissent and mm -hmm. then also to be able to have the system in place mm -hmm. for them to dissent in what's a respectful and a, a useful way? Right, that's a great question um, because it, it, it you know, begs questions of sociology, begs questions of ethics, begs questions of the law. So let me just try to address it a little bit. You know, I, again, I, I, I can't uh, claim any uh, authority, maybe not even familiarity with what happens in our, our you know, militaries from sister, uh, sister countries. But in the U.S. military, for example, in the U.S. Marine Corps, the oaths that are taken by officers and enlisted people are different. So the oath for, as you know, the oath for an officer, I solemnly swear, you know, support and defend the Constitution of the United States, yada, 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 help me God. For a, sorry, uh, you know, you get to it. I meant every word of it, I you know it. Um, uh, for, the, for an enlisted person, the oath includes, and I, and I promise to obey the lawful orders of those appointed over me. That part of the oath does not exist in the officer oath. So the, so it's written into what we expect of them. I think, and this is where I think kind of the sociology aspect uh, comes in, because of course, traditionally over centuries, the officer corps was drawn from a more highly educated elite social uh, class, while the enlisted ranks across services uh, were drawn from lower socioeconomic classes. And while some of that still exists, certainly in the American context, not only do we have the most highly educated military we've ever had at both the enlisted and, and officer levels. Um, we also are operating environments increasingly, whereas you know, um, you know, General uh, Chuck Krulak is famous for coining the phrase the strategic corporal, right? So the notion that even an enlisted person who's standing at checkpoint or guarding a prison or, um, or you know, manning a launch site or anything else um, can be placed in a position where her choices can actually have strategic consequences. Uh, so if that is the case, I completely agree with you that we ought to be thinking about the questions of dissent, not only for officers, but also for enlisted people, even understanding that still the nature of their oath and, and the scopes of their, you know, presumed responsibility in the normal course of their duties are different. Now, one of the other things I think it's important to note is that and certainly in the context of a, of a series of unfortunate you know, training accidents that, you know, going back a decade and a half, we now at least at the, um, in, in training environments, boot camps and A schools and things of that nature, have the concept of a training timeout, right? You know, so I, you know, private schmatz, feel like I'm about to have a heart attack or on this run and call a training timeout. It's technically possible, um, but you better be right. Uh, and uh, but but this this but again this goes back to all the other sorts of things that we talked about before that even if the presumption is dissent we are, even if the presumption is obedience it is also important to train on dissent to train and practice it uh, so that uh, members of the military and civilians uh, who work with them as well know like increasingly we do in the State Department what appropriate dissent looks like, what appropriate dissent feels like, and also how one can dissent as a way of actually protecting both the mission and the institution itself. Yes, sir. Hi, Doyle I'm the Embassy Fellow at the Stockdale Center at the Naval Academy this year. Go Navy, beat Army. Indeed. <laughs> Next um, year. <laughs> I, I wanted to uh, address the three assumptions that you mentioned sure. uh, in terms of the norm of obedience, and right. they, those seem to be the grounds of what you consider to be appropriate dissent. The first being legality, mm -hmm. the second being compliance with an ethical code, and the mm -hmm. third being that the order is in the national interest. Mm 
And while I understand the first two, and we've spoken to them a little bit, the third seems to me particularly problematic, yes. and one that's not shared by necessarily many scholars of civil military relations or others. Peter Fever, for example, would speak of the civilian's right to be wrong. And so I guess my question is, in the national interest is judged by whom? Yes. Because indeed, when a military starts to have the ability to independently <clears throat> assess what's in the national interest, there's certainly a, a very well-respected school of thoughts that suggests that that short circuit self-determination and meaningful mm -hmm. democratic participation. Yes. And so how is it that you would address that? And it also raises the question then of obedience, not purely in the practical mode that you mm -hmm. discussed in terms right. of the necessity to execute right. policy, right. but also as a duty in which yes. it takes an ethical value. So I was wondering yes. if you could speak to those. It's a great, great question and a very hard one. Um, let me give you a couple of reasonable examples. Um, so on the one hand of the argument is, you know, what you've, you know, suggested is, you know, Peter Fever's um, approach, which is obviously is, uh, has, has a great deal of merit, which is if we, and let's posit that we're talking in the American context and those that are, you know, similarly situated. If we live in a democracy, the people's will must be respected and civilian control of the military means that the military has to obey the policy direction of the elected government of the day. And even if one can reasonably debate the merits of the position that the government has taken. Let me give you kind of two very real world examples that have caused me to, to reflect about the least sort of show why that is problematic. Um, so we are in the year 2017. Uh, and we still have forces in the field that are actively engaged in combat all over the world in the context of an authorization of use of military force that was authorized in 2001 for a very specific threat against Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, and then it was subsequently spread to Iraq. It has gotten, it has spread more and more and more and gotten thinner and thinner and thinner as we've got along to the point where there have been at least some military officers who have taken to a greater or lesser extent asked the question, is that, do we still even have legally the authority to continue to actually sort of wage war on an increasingly sort of read thin, you know, uh, 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 authorization? Um, and what is my responsibility as somebody who is sworn to uphold and defend not the government of the day, but the constitution of the United States? to continue to wage war in what might otherwise be a questionable uh, environment. Now, and that applies not only sort of like on a big kind of macro questions, whether or not we're gonna deploy, but whether or not we have eyes on this particular target of this particular bad person in this particular country on these two dates, when we have these assets that could launch these weapons in this environment, and oh, by the way, if we do, we think we're actually gonna have you know, these sets of civilian casualties, right? I mean, so these are actually real sort of, you know, uh, fair questions. I'll give you another example, a very recent one. So I've spent more and more of my time in the last decade now working on Africa. And one of the interesting things that has happened in U.S. engagement with Africa over the last decade is the creation of the U.S. Africa Command, which is now 10 years old this year. Uh, one of the things that those officers and enlisted people do is a series of military engagements all across Africa to strengthen indigenous African militaries, build strategic partnerships, et cetera. As you may know, the President of the United States recently expressed his view about the entirety of the continent of Africa. It was not favorable. So if you are a major who has to go lead a detachment, a training detachment in Senegal or Mali. And amongst the things you're doing, you know, as the end of the exercise, you know, you have a local uh, reporter who stands up, puts a microphone in your face and says, so Major Schmatz, we understand your commander in chief said this about Africa. Do you agree with your commander in chief about his, his assertion about all of our military? How are you supposed to adjudicate that particular, in addition to like the jujitsu of how do you think through, you know, you know, media training that you, maybe you didn't did or didn't get before you left Stuttgart, right? I mean, how are you supposed to actively um, continue to develop a partnership when the 
commander in chief has laid out, frankly, a very sort of different view of who your strategic partners ought to be and why. So, um, so, so I, I, I can credibly make the case that while I understand the general argument that questions of uh, what is in the best national security of the interests of the country ought to be beyond the purview of making ethical decisions, particularly when it relates to potential dissent. I can also see from real world examples why, frankly, they ought to be. Precisely because you can, one can foresee the environment, and this is, why, this is why we're having the whole conversation of dissent. One can foresee a situation in which the civilian masters or the civilian leadership who in the analysis I laid out are presumed to be operating in a legal and ethical way aren't. And thus, one could also make, therefore, the argument that perhaps the most important ethical decision that somebody could do at some other point down the chain is at a minimum flag the, flag the dissent and perhaps even sort of act on it. And that's why these are really hard questions. Ladies. One more. Yes, ma'am. So obedience is vital. I'm sorry, your name, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Nikki Coleman. I'm from the Royal Australian Air Force. Go Air Force, beat Navy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that works down under, but we have a different way. No, I know. Uh, I've lived in Annapolis, yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. <laughs> um, so obedience is vital to military culture. Yes. And um, it's an, a profession unique, and I use that, that very selectively, compared to any other um, profession or organisation or job um, in regards to obedience and having to obey orders. Um, it's the only profession where you can go to jail for um, disobeying a legal oh, order. Um, so it's vital to military culture. In Australia, we have value statements for the Army, Navy, Air Force, for all of the, for the overarching defence, we also have one for the Defence Force Academy, and we have um, value statements for various different brigades and so on. None of those mention obedience hmm. at all. So I don't know if, how that is internationally. I'd like to hear if your militaries hmm. have them internationally. So it begs the question, we want dissent, obviously, because we don't want another My Lai or Fat right. Leonard or Abu Ghraib, right. but are we ready to actually encourage dissent if we can't even put obedience, if we can't even talk about obedience, yes. how do we then authentically talk about dissent? Right. That's why you're scholars and that's what your job <laughs> is to do. Uh, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't mean that to be, you know, too flippant, um, as, as much as to say that, you know, sometimes um, it is not unique to the military. Organizations often sometimes have the, the most difficulty in transforming themselves and asking sort of really difficult questions. Uh, and sometimes it takes people that are actually sort of enabled and can take some, not only by their position, because they're a tenured professor or whatnot, but also by virtue of being close enough to the organization, but not of it, uh, in it but not of it, to be able to ask these hard questions. Um, and I, 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 what is clear to me is that the normal, traditional, centuries-old framework of obedience being the you know, stop, start, end uh, of military life is no longer valuable, completely unchallengeable in a current strategic environment. Mm -hmm. And thus one has to grapple with these hard questions of what does appropriate dissent look like and how do we talk about it? Um, and I don't know what the right answer is, but I certainly do you know, know that that is the appropriate question. And I look forward to seeing you know, additional scholarship and debates in that regard. Thank you so much for having me. I wish gives me my best wishes for a great conference. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to thank you thank again. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> We've got pleasure. a little gift for you. So thank you. Thank you for launching us so well uh, with so many excellent questions and insights uh, from your own life experience. We are very grateful. And I also appreciated hearing about uh, the um, exciting programs and efforts at, at the Elliott School. And uh, we definitely agree that it shouldn't be a competition. We want many such programs and many things uh, blooming all over so that we can get the kind of uh, position to challenge and make the, the questions um, asked that need to be asked. And as you just clarified, sometimes we're the only ones who can do that. <laughs> so we have to take that role very seriously.